Well, I had met Ed Teller at Los Alamos one day. Uh, we had a brief meeting and a, and a talk. Uh, I had shortly thereafter moved to Las Vegas and basically left the scientific community to do other work. Uh, some time later, I decided to re-enter and send applications out to several other national labs and also one to Ed Teller. And he uh, gave me a call and he said uh, he might have something that I'd be interested in and suggested uh, that I go for an interview. Uh, shortly thereafter, someone from EGNG called and told me to come down for an interview there. Uh, they made it very clear that EG&G had nothing to do with it. They were just using the building as a place to do the interview. After a short time, they said I was basically overqualified for the position, but they may have something else in the future. And I don't remember how much time lapsed after that, but uh, shortly thereafter, they asked me to come down for another interview, and uh, they said this was involving... Uh, I don't remember their exact wording, but they led me to believe it was uh, a field propulsion system. And, of course, I thought it was something that, in secret, that we were working on. Uh, later, only did I find out that it was, uh, you know, a back engineering program dealing with alien craft. I flew out of Las Vegas McCarran Airport, and I flew to Groom Lake in a 737 aircraft. We land at Groom Lake, and there's a bus there that drives about 15 miles south, approximately. I'm, I'm really not sure exactly how far, uh, down to a smaller dry lake bed known as Papoose Lake. And right up against the side of the mountain is the uh, S4 installation. And what happened to you first when you entered it? How was your reception? It was very military-like. It was uh, certainly not a scientific atmosphere. Uh, very high security. Everywhere you, you walked, you had to have an escort, an armed escort, even, even into the bathroom. Uh, all doors lock and open with your, uh, with your badge. And uh, it was a very oppressive atmosphere. And how many times uh, did you spend on this atmosphere before you saw the craft for the first time? Uh, I believe I was only there two or three days, probably two days before I saw the craft. Well, my feelings, it was a very uh, uh, I should step back a minute and say that when I first saw the craft the first time, it was walking into the hangar and uh, my impression was, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. This is just a secret military aircraft we're working on, and that's the end of that. It was actually the second time when I saw the craft, when I got to enter it and look over it, and I finally realized what was going on, that this is an alien craft. And, of course, this was after I read the briefings, and uh, that was a totally different feeling. That was not a feeling of excitement. It was a, almost an, an ominous feeling, that uh, a feeling as if you shouldn't even be there. It's very difficult to describe. It looked like, uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, Billy Myers' uh, sightings, very astonishingly similar to that, uh, that craft. It was uh, a very sleek, thin-looking uh, flying saucer-shaped craft. Uh, kind of hard to describe without drawing it, but uh, kind of a, a typical flying saucer shape. Did you um, see just one type or different types? There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work, back engineer, or analyze one of the craft, but there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you about the U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it, that they were either shot down or they crashed. Uh, but uh, the craft seemed undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct.
It's very plain. It's all one solid color, uh, a, a grayish pewter color, the same color as the outside of the craft. Yeah, there are no sharp corners anywhere. Every device in the craft, the seat, uh, the amplifier housings, everything has a rounded corner on it, almost as if it was all fashioned out of wax and then slightly melted so everything curved, even where the ceiling meets the floor on the end. Everything has a, a curve to it. Um, very, very plain, very wide open, uh, very impractical use of space. And there are three levels. The lower level um, houses the amplifiers themselves that swing, the three of them. The center level is where you enter the craft, where the seats and the amplifiers are. And the uh, top level is a small area, and I did not have access to that, so I don't know what's up there. Do you think they're alien craft or western craft? Uh, absolutely alien craft. There's no question about it. Why? Well, first of all, the scope of the project was to back engineer it if they were... United States craft, we wouldn't be going back. We're trying to find out how they were built if we had built them. Uh, second of all, the size of uh, the equipment inside, the size of the seats, the uh, materials that were in use, completely alien to us, pardon the pun, and uh, you know the fuel, element 115, essentially non-existent. Uh, all these factors together, uh, and of course the briefing information stating that they were alien craft. Um, could anybody tell you how the propulsion function? Well, that was part of my job, was to back engineer that and uh, find out exactly how that operated. And they had made some progress, but uh, I really don't know how long the craft was, was there being analyzed, uh, if it was one year or ten years before I got there, but it seems like uh, only a modest amount of progress had been made. The propulsion system is really an amazing setup. Uh, there's two parts, gravity amplifiers uh, and the reactor that provides the power. The reactor itself is a, a total annihilation reactor uh, fueled by antimatter. Total annihilation is essentially the most efficient uh, nuclear reaction that takes place of the three, fission, fusion, and uh, annihilation. It uses a super heavy element, element 115, uh, as it would appear on the periodic chart. None has yet been synthesized on Earth. Um, it's my opinion that this occurs naturally in, in certain star systems. This element is bombarded in a, an extremely small accelerator. Uh, the element under bombardment uh, undergoes spontaneous fission and produces uh, any matter particles. These are interacted with a gaseous matter target, and by means of a 100% efficient uh, thermoelectric device is converted uh, into electricity. Now, 100% efficient, uh, any electric device is essentially impossible. Uh, you know, the first law of thermodynamics is that's basically impossible. There has to be waste heat and things of that sort, but there's none detected in, in the system. That's uh, another amazing form of technology. Uh, this uh, tremendous amount of power the system generates uh, operates the amplifiers and also as a byproduct of the 115 undergoing uh, uh, this bombardment, it produces a uh, very interesting phenomena, a gravity A wave as it's known to be called. Uh, this gravity A wave is uh, it travels in um, almost the same way microwaves travel. Uh, this is essentially applied to the gravity amplifiers and by means of the electric current also provided by the reactor, it's amplified and focused. Uh, the amplified signal is shif shifted slightly out of phase and, and by virtue of that they can repel or attract uh, a gravitational body. The craft can take off on one gravity amplifier. There are three in this particular craft. Uh, when it's using just one amplifier, essentially push, pushing away from the Earth, it's known as Omicron configuration. 